Hello students, you know who this is, your professor Dr. Mink, and welcome to the audio lecture for Chapter 6, Input-Output Streams as an Introduction to Objects and Classes. Not only will we cover input-output file streams, but we will use them as an introduction to objects and classes in the object-oriented programming arena. Let's take a look. This slide shows the three main topics we will cover in Chapter 6. Section 6.1, Streams and Basic File Input-Output. 6.2, Tools for Stream Input-Output. And last, but certainly not least, Character Input-Output. We will start with a discussion of basic file input-output streams. In most large-scale data processing environments, the primary source of input is not the keyboard. Think about a scenario where a large uh, retail chain is managing inventory replenishment. In the middle of the night, you've got all of these uh, inventory transactions being reconciled on maybe a mainframe or a large-scale computer system and they are all written to a file and then the program uses that input from the file all those transactions it could be thousands might even be millions of transactions if you think of a Walmart or a large-scale um, uh, organization in the retail market you have millions of transactions that are recorded every day and they are written to some sort of transaction file and then the program uses that as input and will probably generate output that will be written to a file permanently. Let's take a closer look. You'll frequently see the term I.O. I.O. refers to program input and output how data gets into the program, and how data is output from the program. Input is delivered to your program via a stream object. Input can come from the keyboard, or input can also come from a file. Up until this point, we've only handled input using CN from the keyboard. In this lecture, <coughs> excuse me, we will talk about file streams and input from a file. Output is delivered to the output device via a stream object. The object, I'm sorry, the output can be to the screen via Cout, which is what we've done up until this point, or to a file, given an output file stream. And we will talk about that in detail next. We will also use file streams to talk about object orientation. Objects are variables, but they're special variables. And they have their, special, their own special purpose functions associated with those objects. Objects set C++ apart from earlier programming languages that did not have objects. The files that we are going to use for input and output are the same types of files that you would use to store other information on your computer. A stream is a flow of data. And we have two types of streams, input and output streams. Obviously, in an input stream, well, maybe not obviously, but in an input stream, data flows into the program. You can think of uh, this similar to C in. Um, if the input stream flows from the keyboard, the program will accept data from the keyboard via C in. If the input stream flows from a file, the program will accept data from the file and output streams are data flowing out of the program either to the screen with C out 
or to a file with an output file stream. Here we have a quick review of CN and Cout streams. CN is an input stream that is connected to the keyboard. In this chapter, we'll talk about input streams that are connected to a file. Cout is an output stream connected to the screen. The definitions of CN and Cout are defined in the IO stream library, and we have always included, if we're going to use CN and Cout, we've always included the directive for the IO stream library. You can declare your own streams to use with files. I touched on this in an earlier slide. Files, one advantage of files is that they store data permanently. Output to the screen is soft copy output. It is not permanent. If you output data to a file, it lasts after the program ends. An input file can be used over and over and over again. No typing of data again and again for testing. You can create a data file or read an, input, or an output file at your convenience. And as I mentioned in a previous slide, files allow you to deal with larger data sets. Remember the scenario I described at the beginning of this lecture where Walmart has that inventory transaction reconciliation that might take place at 3 o'clock in the morning where all of those inventory transactions are processed and the database of inventory is reconciled. That's not done with CN keyboard input. That is done with sometimes millions of records of inventory transactions that are written to a file. File I.O. deals with reading input from a file and writing output to the file. It's typically, for now, done from the beginning of the file to the end of the file. There is no backing up to read something again. And it is done just as it is from the keyboard. When we are writing to a file, we are writing from the beginning to the end. For now, we, we're going to get into some special techniques that allow us to not go linear from start to finish. But let's just hold on for now on that topic. Um, stream variables are very similar to other variables. You must declare a stream variable before it can use be used, and it must be initialized before it can contain valid data. The slight difference is initialing a stream variable means that we connect it to an existing file. Uh, the value of the stream variable can be thought of as the file it is connected to, and it can have its value changed. Changing a, stream va changing a stream variable's value, sorry, <laughs> changing a stream variable's value means you disconnect it from one file and connect it to another file. Similar to changing the contents of a variable. A stream is a special kind of variable which is called an object. Objects use special functions to complete tasks. Streams use special functions instead of the assignment operator to change values. Let's talk about declaring input file stream variables. The data type for input file streams are IF stream. The IF stream type is defined in the F stream library, which means we will, when using input output file streams, we will have a new include directive 
and that it's listed here on this slide. It's the F stream. And it uses namespace standard just like IO stream to declare an input file stream variable using IF stream and then the name. In this particular case, we're naming <coughs> an input stream variable in underscore stream. That's the declaration type. It should look very similar. It's like declaring an int or a double. And we use the same process to declare an output file stream variable. Um, output file streams are of type OF stream and they are declared, or I'm sorry, defined in the F stream library. So you would include the F stream directive and using namespace standard and to declare an output file stream using output file stream variable OF stream space out underscore stream is used to declare an output stream variable called outstream, very similar to an input file stream. Now we start to get into object specific terminology. Once we've declared a file stream variable, we must initialize it by connecting it to a file. And when we connect a stream to a file, we open the file for input or output. And we use the open function of the stream object. Remember, objects are special variables that have special functions associated with them. So in this particular case, the first function we're going to, object function we're going to explore is the open function. And below, you'll see at the bottom of this slide, you'll see the syntax for opening or, or, or initializing the in-stream file variable. In-stream.open, and then in parentheses, encased in double quotes, is the name of the file on the disk. That is an actual operating system file name. And of course we've got a semicolon. Once you've connected the input stream to a file, the input stream variable can be used to receive input or produce input just as you would use CN with the extraction operator. Here's an example. We're declaring two, two integer variables named one number and another number. And we're going to initialize those variables not from CN, not from the keyboard, but from the in stream, the input file stream. So it's going to go into that file and pull one number and then another number. And then an output file stream works very similarly to the input stream. And here we have a sequence of code. First we are declaring an output file stream object called outstream, out underscore stream. We are connecting it to a file using the open function, and the file name is outfile.dat. I will tell you that if outfile.dat does not exist, because this is a write process, W-R-I-T-E, not R-I-G-H-T, if outfile does not, outfile.dat does not exist, this function will create it. Outstream, extraction operator, one number equals, so that's, that's going to be literal output to outfile.dat. 
and then we're outputting the value of one number and then more literal output another number equals another numbers variable value I mentioned this before Ex external file name is the name of a file that the operating system uses in the previous example we used infile.dat and outfile.dat those are um, you know, flat files um, stored on the disk um, you have to match the naming conventions on your system um, usually only used in the streams open statement once open refer to using the name of the stream connected to it so you're not going to use the file name once you have used the open function connect to to connect the file stream to that object after you're finished using a file it should be closed this connect this disconnects the stream from the file you close files to reduce the chance of a file being corrupted if the program terminates abnormally that can happen it's important to close an output file if your program later needs to read input from the output file which is very common output from one program output files from one program become input files for another program or maybe even the same program the system will automatically close files if you forget as long as your program terminates normally here we have display 6.1 from your textbook very simple program where we're declaring an input file stream named in-stream, an output file stream named out-stream. We are connecting those input file stream and output file stream variables to files named infile.dat for the input file stream. See that in the open statement and outfile.dat. We are declaring three integers, first, second, third. And now that we've got declared and initialized input and output file stream objects, we are writing, I'm sorry, we are inputting the value of first, second, third. We are initializing those variables from infile.dat. And they will receive the values of one, two, and three. And then we are writing to the output file stream. The file is named outfile.dat. And we are writing the literal the sum of the first three um, new line numbers in infile.dat new line is and then we are outputting first plus second plus third the values of first plus second plus third added and resolved in that expression and L and then we're closing the input and output file streams and you can see in the uh, at the bottom of this slide the the content of outfile.dat after the program is run is that literal output the sum of the first three numbers in infile.dat is and then the resolved expression six no output is generated to the screen and there was no input taken from the keyboard An object is a variable that has functions and data associated with it. Instream and outstream each have a function named open associated with them. Instream and outstream use different versions of the function named open. One version of open is for input files and a different version of open is for output files objects have member functions a set of functions that are associated with that particular object the open function is considered a member function of in stream in the previous examples a different open function is a member of outstream in the previous examples
there is some overlap between objects and member function names. Different types of objects have different member functions, but some of those member functions might have the same name, such as open. Different objects of the same type have all the same member functions. A class is a type whose variables are objects. ifStream is the type of the in-stream variable object. ifStream is a class. The class of an object determines which member functions it has. An example would be, here we're declaring two input file stream objects, in-stream1 and in-stream2. in-stream1.open and in-stream2.open both use the same function, but they have different arguments. They're connected, they're probably connected to different files. The member function that an object has access to, or that an object can use, are the member functions of its class. The class determines which member functions the object can use. The class ifStream has an open function. Each variable or object that is declared of type ifStream has access to that open function. In order to call a member function, you must specify the object that contains the function. The calling object is separated from the member function by the dot operator, period. Here's an example. The calling object is in stream. You've got the dot operator, and then the member function is open. And we're opening, the argument is the file name. The argument of that function open is the file name in file.dat. Here we see the formal syntax for calling a member function, the object, the calling object name, dot operator, the member function name, and then in parentheses the argument list and a semicolon. This is a very common situation, an error on opening a file. It could fail for a couple reasons. The file might not exist. Remember, in, in opening an input file stream, the file must exist. Or the name might be typed incorrectly. And there may be no error message if the call to open fails and the program execution continues. So this is a um, difficult error to troubleshoot. So to help catch stream errors, we have a member function named fail. And we use this to test the success of a stream operation. Fail returns a Boolean type true or false. Fail returns true if the stream operation failed. I, I never like that logic there. It returns true if it failed. That, that's not intuitive for me, but it is what it is. When Opening a file stream fails. It's advisable to stop the program. So we have the function exit, which halts the program. Exit returns its argument to the operating system and causes the program to stop executing. Exit is not a member function. Exit requires the include and using directives, C standard library, and namespace standard. Here's how we use fail and exit. Immediately following the call to open, check that the operation was successful. Here we have some code, and we're, we're using the open function on the in-stream to connect to a file stuff.dat. Immediately following that call to the open function, we check if in-stream.fail if it does, 
you just put an out, output C out, input file opening failed, and then exit and return a 1. Let's take a look at a implemented, some implemented code with this function. Here we have a fully implemented program that includes uh, an if statement that checks if the input file stream failed and also if the output file stream failed. I will tell you it's much more common for an input file stream to fail than it is for an output file stream to fail. If um, this is a hybrid or a traditional class, we will actually implement this code in class as um, part of the learning process. If you're viewing this lecture as part of a totally online class, which I haven't implemented yet, but we're thinking about it in the future, then I, I strongly urge you to pull up 6.2, run this code, change the name of the input file to something other than infile.dat, make it infile1.dat, and then the program will fail. When you're reading input from a file, remember, you do not need to include prompts or echo the input. You're not directing a user via the keyboard to enter input. So the line C out, enter the number, C in the number, C out the number you entered is the number, just become one line. In file, the number. All of our output examples to this point create new files or overwrite the existing file. If you want to add the output to the existing output or to the existing data in the file, that's called appending the data to the file. So we must use the constant IOS colon colon append defined in the IOStream library. So to open a file as an out and attach it to an outstream object and have the output written to that file appended, added to the end, you use this line of code, outstream dot, well the outstream object had to have been declared, dot open, important dot text, in double quotes, comma, iOS, colon, colon, app. If the first time you run this code, the file does not exist, it will create a new file, and then the second time you write it, it will append the output from run number two to whatever output was generated from run number one, and so on and so on. Here we have program 6.3 from your textbook, and it demonstrates the use of appending output. Notice we declare an output file stream object called fout, and then we use the open function with fout to connect it to the file name data.txt with the iOS append constant. So if you look at the sample dialog at the bottom, data.txt before the program is run contains the lines one, two, bucket my shoe, I thought it was buckle my shoe, three, four, shut the door, anyway. Um, and then come back to the program, F out the literal text, five, six, pick up sticks, new line, seven, eight, ain't C++ great, new line, how corny. Uh, and then look at data.txt after the program is run. Well, the initial data that was in there, one, two, bucket my shoe, three, four, shut the door, is not overwritten. Instead, the output from the program run is appended to the end of data.txt. You can use a file name as input or as optional input. The user can enter the name of a file to use for input or for output 
The program must use a variable that can hold multiple characters. A sequence of characters is called a string. So we declare a variable to hold a string of characters. Here's an example, char, file name, 16 characters. File name is the name of a variable. Brackets enclose the maximum number of characters, plus 1. So in this particular case, we can hold 15 characters. The variable name contains up to 15 characters. Here's an example of some code that uses a character string as uh, an input file name. So we define this string named file name, maximum of 15 characters, it's n minus 1. C out, enter the file name, C in file name, and then we declare input file stream named in stream. We use the open function to connect it to the file name. Now that must be exact. And I strongly suggest you have that fail test in there. Let's take a look at a fully implemented encoded solution. On this slide in the next, you see program 6.4 from your textbook, which has a fully implemented solution that includes an input file name and uh, an input for the output file name also. You can see we declare two character strings, in file name, out file name, each holding a maximum of 15 char characters, and an input file stream called in stream, an output file stream called out stream. You prompt the user to enter um, the, the uh, file name for in file name and the output file name for out file name, and then they are used with the open function with the in-stream and out-stream object, and we'll take a look at the next slide of a dialog for this program. Here you see the dialog of the program, and we even uh, place the uh, input file name in the out-stream file, sum.dat. We're taking this as a hybrid or a traditional class. We will uh, run this program in class. This is the end of section 6.1. Here are some questions, tasks for you to consider. If you um, can write a program that uses a stream called fn, which will be connected to an input file, and stream called fout, which will be connected to an output file. How do you declare f in and out? f out. What include directive, if any, do you need to place in your program file and name at least three member functions of an IO stream object and give examples of usage of each? You should be able to do that. If not, please go back and review this lecture and the contents of the textbook in section 6.1. Thanks. Section 6.2 discusses tools for um, input-output streams, formatting, decimal places, currency, etc., etc. Let's move forward. We have commands to control the format of the program's output. We can control the spaces between items, the number of digits after a decimal point, the numeric style, whether it's scientific notation or fixed point, uh, showing digits after a decimal point, even if there are zeros, showing plus signs in front of positive numbers, left or right justifying numbers in a given space, etc. Let's take a closer look. This slide shows a comparison of formatting output to files versus formatting output to the screen. As you can see, it's, it's very, very similar. Instead of cout.setf, you've got outstream object name.setf. You've got the um, commands for fixed point showing the decimal place and the number of decimal places to the right of the decimal point in this slide. Precision is a member function of output streams, and 
after output stream dot precision with an argument of two output of numbers with decimal points will show a total of two significant digits uh, calls to precision only apply to the stream named in the call set f which is an abbreviation for set flags is a member function of output streams flag is an instruction to do one of two options ios colon colon fixed is a flag um, all further output after this flag is set all further output of Floating point numbers will be written in fixed point notation the way we normally expect to see numbers. Calls to set F apply only to the stream named in the call, obviously. And here we have the um, iOS show point flag. It works exactly the same way as it does with C out. Output of floating point numbers will show the decimal point, even if all digits after, after the decimal point are zeros. This slide shows formatting flags for set F. You have fix, scientific, show point, show pause. If this flag is set up, a plus sign is output before positive integer values. And the default is in the third column. Many of these are not set. Uh, the default is right justification. That's the iOS right flag. And iOS left provides left justification. The with function is a member function of the fstream class and it is used to specify the number of spaces for the next item put into the output stream. It applies only to the next item of output. Here's an example of how to use output stream, I'm sorry, with to send the digit 7 in four spaces to the output stream outstream dot with four is the argument and then outstream send seven and L three of the spaces will be blank the um, diagram at the bottom shows two scenarios one with right justification and one with left justification don't worry if you have the width of the output stream set too small because if a value that exceeds the width is sent to the output stream the entire item is always output if too few spaces are specified as many more spaces as needed are used the flags you set are like toggle switches when you turn them on they stay on and, and you have to turn them off or unset them any flag that is set can be unset with the unsetf function. Here's an example of um, unsetting the show pause flag, which shows a positive or a plus sign in front of positive numbers. Unsetf will uh, cause the program to stop printing plus signs in front of positive numbers. We touched on manipulators um, earlier with C in and C out. A manipulator is a way of calling a function in a non-traditional way. Manipulators, um, when called, they call the member functions, and they may or may not have arguments. They're used after the insertion operator as if the ma manipulator function call is an output item. It's a non-traditional way to call the member functions and you m in order to use the manipulators you must include the IO manip directive or library set W is an example of a manipulator that performs the same task as a member function with it actually calls the with function to set spaces for output and here's an example where in the C out stream we're outputting the literal text start and then we're with a manipulator we're changing the spacing to four and we're outputting a 10 which puts two spaces to the left of it and then we're setting the width to four again outputting a 20 which puts two spaces 
to the left of it. Then we're setting the width to 6, now putting 30, which puts four spaces to the left of the two, vid two digits required for 30. Here's another example of the set precision, uh, another manipulator called set precision. And it calls the member function precision. And here we use set flags to set fixed point and to show the decimal place. And then we use the set precision manipulator to output 10.30, set the precision to two decimal places, two significant decimal places to the right of the decimal point to output um, 10.3 and 20.5 as currency. I mentioned this in an earlier slide, but here it is on this one. In order to use the manipulators set W and set precision, you must include the IO manipuli IO manip <laughs> sorry, IO manip library via an include directive as listed here. And it uses namespace standard for all of those manipulator functions. You can pass a stream as an argument to a function. The only requirement is, this, is that the function's formal parameter for the stream must be called by reference, meaning you're actually passing a pointer to the stream. You can't and it, it makes sense. You can't pass call by value. And if you think about that, it's obvious. In many cases, the input files used by a program have variable lengths. You don't know exactly how many data elements exist in the file when you start to read from it. Loops are very useful in reading in reading input from a file. And a way to know when the end of the file is reached is the Boolean expression listed here. In stream, next, the insertion operator. It reads, it does two things. It reads a value from the file connected to in stream and stores it in the variable next and also returns true if a value can be read and stored in next and it returns false if there's not a value to be read. In other words, when it reaches the end of the file, that Boolean expression turns to false. So it's ideal to use as a condition in a while loop, do while, etc. Here's an example of some code that's rather commonly used. Calculate the average of numbers in a file. And with this code, there could be three numbers. There could be 3,687,263 numbers. It doesn't matter. This code is going to read in each number sequentially until it re and add it to sum, increment the counter until it reaches the end of file. In other words, until the condition in the while statement goes from true to false and that is when it reaches the end of file and sum will contain the sum of all the numbers count will count each time it reads in a new number and then the loop stops and then you calculate the average as the sum divided by count very simple and this can handle any number of um, data elements in a file please take a close look at this code. This code and iterations of this code are going to be used extensively from this point on in processing files as input. In class, I will give you an input file and ask you to write a short program to calculate the average of all the numbers in the file provided. I ask that you not manually count the numbers of data items and let the program loop until it finds the end of the file. And you will use the code in the while loop with the condition we discussed on the previous page, previous slide. The using directives, the, the 
file libraries, class libraries, uh, have been local to function definitions in some examples so far. When parameter type names are in a namespace, a using directive must be outside the function so C++ will understand the parameter type names such as IF stream. An easy solution is to place the using directive at the beginning of the file and, and we've done this for the most part, put it in the header. Many experts don't approve as this does not allow using multiple namespaces with the names in common. In other words, it makes it a global namespace. Within the context of this course, we are not going to get to alternate namespaces, but you should know that there are things as alternate namespaces which lead some people to want to put the namespace local to a function. That is beyond the scope of this course, but I just want to make a reference to it so you know why that happens sometime. Next, we're going to take a look at program 6.6 .6 from your textbook. It takes input from raw data dot dat and writes output to the screen and to a file, an output file called neat dot dat. When you take a look at raw data dot dat, and I've placed this compressed solution in the web study timeline so you don't have to page through the next three slides and look at one third of the program and then the middle one third and then the last one third. I, I suggest that you pause this presentation and go to web study timeline and look at 6.6. .6. You'll see raw data dot dat is a real messy file, spaces all over the place, multiple decimal places. It's, it's just a mess. And the function that's used presents formatting instructions to create a neater layout. Numbers are written one per line in a field width of 12. Each number is written with five divot, digit, divots. <laughs> I'm not golfing. With five digits after the decimal point. And each number is written with a plus or minus sign. So it uses the function make neat that has formal parameters for the input file stream and output file stream. We'll take a look at that in a second. Here's the first slide that shows um, the IO manip include directive that you need for the set w manipulator. And you'll see the function declaration of the void function make neat and notice that it passes IF stream and OF stream objects in a call by reference parameter to a function that's going to take the messy file, set all the formatting flags, and output it as a neat file. Let's take a look at the next slide. This slide shows details on the function that does the work, make neat. And it passes call by reference an IF stream object, the formal parameter name is messy file, and an output file stream object passed call by reference, formal parameter name is neat file, and then an integer, uh, the number after the decimal place, and an integer for the field, total field width. So this will set the number of decimal places and the total field width. And if you notice at the top of the slide, there is the call to make neat and it passes fn, which is the input file stream object, f out, five decimal places, and a total field width of 12. And you'll see in the loop, the while loop, it reads in each item from the messy file, outputs it via c out to the screen, with a set w field width, and it also outputs to neat file. This slide shows you a few things. It shows you um, 
raw.dat, the, the input file, it's not changed. And it's, well, it's messy. And then you see the contents of neat.dat, the output file stream object, the file connected to the output file stream object. And you'll see that it has a total width of, I think it was 15, five places to the right of the decimal point, plus and minus sign in front of each item, and each item on its own line. This is very nice, neat output generated from the messy input in raw data dot dat, and that same output is echoed to the screen with C out. I strongly urge you to pull up the code, the compressed solution for 6.6 .6 from the timeline. Go in, play around with the width, the number of decimal places, play around with the manipulators and the set F flags and get a feel for how this is done. You will see this again in this class. I know it's going to take a little bit more time, but I strongly urge you to pause the presentation now and go take a look at this while it's fresh in your mind. That concludes section 6.2, and here are a few things for you to consider. You know, can you show the output produced when the following line is executed? It has a IO manipulator at set W, and you should be able to describe that output and describe the effect of each of these flags. Let's move on to section 6.3 and end this chapter. The last section in chapter 6, 6.3, deals with character I.O. And that is breaking down the input and output one character at a time versus one int or one bool or one whatever. And you'll see why this is necessary and how it compares to um, item input and item output. Using character I.O., all data, input and output from the program, is handled as individual characters. So output of the number 10 is two characters, 1 and 0. Input of the number 10 is also done as two characters, 1 and 0. Interpretation of 10 as the number 10 or as characters depends on the program. Conversion between characters and numbers is usually automatic. Next, we'll discuss low-level character I.O., crunching through the input and output data one character at a time. There are low-level C++ functions that perform character I.O. These do not perform automatic conversions. They allow you to do input and output in any way you can devise. Let's take a closer look. Every input stream has a member function named get. And get is used to read one character from an input stream. And it stores the character read in a variable of type char. The single argument the function accepts or takes. The get function does not use the extraction operator, which performs some automatic work. And you'll see the difference between using the extraction operator versus using get. One glaring difference is that get does not skip blanks. It gets a blank as the next char. And it also does not skip the end of line character, which we'll get to in a second in depth. Here we have some code that illustrates the use of the member function get with C the cn input stream. So first we declare a char called next symbol, and then we use the get member function. It's a member function of the IO stream and also F stream with cn, the object. And the argument is next symbol. So the next character in the input stream will be read with these statements, and it will be placed 
its value will be placed in the variable, the char variable next symbol. If it's a blank space, it'll be read in the next symbol. If it's the new line character, it'll be read in the next symbol. Unlike the extraction operator, it does not skip end of line and blank cars. Here is the syntax for get member function and examples of it used with CN and IF stream. You've got the input stream object dot get and then the car variable is the argument. First example is the example we saw on the previous page declaring a car called next symbol cn.get to get the next car in the input stream and placing its value in the next symbol. Very similar. Declare an if stream object called in stream in stream dot open connected to in file dot dat in stream dot get next symbol calls the get member function of the if stream object in stream and it takes in this particular case it would take the first char in the in file dot dat file and copy its value into in stream I'm sorry next symbol This is a great slide. I want you to take a very close look at this slide because it presents the difference between using the get member function, the extraction operator, along with CN. So let's take a close look. We declare three cars, C1, C2, C3. And then we have three lines of code using the get member function along with CN. CN.get c1, cn.get c2, cn.get c3. And then the following input, a, b, carriage return or enter, c, d, enter. Given that input, cn.get is going to take a, the first car, place it in c1. cn.get c2 is going to take the second car, b, place its value in C2. CN.get C3 is going to surprise you, maybe, especially if you haven't been paying attention. It's not going to get the next car which we anticipate as C. It's going to get the new line character. So C3 will include the new line character. Whereas, if we used CN with the extraction operator, C1, C2 and C3, that would place C in C3. The extraction operator skips the new line character and also skips spaces. Very, very significant difference between the member function get and the extraction operator when used with CN. Here's some character input and output code that shows how to read an entire line of input looking for the new line character at the end of the input line and then echoing one character at a time using the char symbol to see out. You got to do while and the condition is symbol does not equal the new line character. Because it's a do while and the condition is checked at the end or after the body, all the characters in the line, including the new line character, will be output. This slide shows the difference between a car, which has single quotes, and a string, which has double quotes. A um, new line character stored as a car can be stored in a variable of type car. A string containing only one character uh, cannot be stored in a car variable. Next we took a, take a look at another member function of every output stream called put. It um, has one argument and the argument is a car and it places that argument into the output stream. Places that one car into the output stream it doesn't allow you to do more than um, previous output with the insertion operator and see out. 
just another option. Here we have the formal syntax for the put member function. You have the output stream name dot put and then the one argument is a char. And you see examples of put using with, used with C out and also with output file stream object. I'm not going to read it to you, but you could take a look at that. It's very simple. In the first example, it puts an under a lowercase a into the output stream using C out, sends it to the monitor. And in the second example, using an output file stream, it puts a capital Z. It writes a capital Z in the next location in outfile.dat using the out stream, output file stream object. There are going to be cases where you're reading with a loop and you read in a particular character that stops the loop, a sentinel value, if you will. And, but you, once you've read it, it's out of the input stream. The put back member function places that last character back in the input stream. So the next time you start reading input from the input stream, it starts with the character that terminated the loop. Put back is a member function of every input stream. And as I mentioned, it's useful when input comes until, continues until a specific character is read, but you do not want to process that character. Here's a coded example that implements the put back member function. Let's take a look at the loop first. So we're using the dot get member function along with an input file stream, I'm assuming fn is the input file stream to get next and then so we've got the first character then we enter the loop the while loop while next is not a blank use the put function to put next into the output file stream and then use the get member function to get the next car come back up to the while statement to determine that next the carrier we just got is not the space is not a blank if it is a blank we stop if it isn't a blank we put it in the output stream using the put member function f out and we continue to process until we get to a blank but remember because fn.get is part of the body of this loop we've already removed the space from the input file stream when the loop terminates. So the first thing we want to do after the loop terminates is put back next, which is the space, the blank, which caused the loop to stop. This should be no surprise to you. Incorrect input can produce worthless output. I think the term is garbage in, garbage out. So you should use input functions that allow the user to re-enter input until it is correct. One uh, strategy is to echo the input and ask the user if it is correct. If the input is not correct, allow the user to enter the data again. Let's take a closer look. In the next slide, we'll take a look at a function, getInt, in program 6.7 from your textbook, and getInt obtains an integer value from the user and then get in prompts the user reads the input and displays the input after displaying the input get in ask the user to confirm the number and reads the user's response using a variable of type char this is called echoing the output and confirming entering and echoing the input and confirming the process is repeated until the user indicates with a capital Y or lowercase y, that the number he or she entered is correct. Let's take a closer look. There's a function called the new line function in 6.7, which I promise we're getting to. It's called by the getInt function. The new line function reads all the characters remaining in the input line, but does nothing with them. It, it, 
it discards them. Blue line is used to discard what, what discard the input that follows the first care of the user's response to get lines. Is that correct? Yes or no? The new line character is, is, is discarded as well. Let's take a, a look now at function, I'm sorry, at program 6.7. Finally, we have <coughs> program 6.7 to take a look at. You can see we have the two void functions, new line and get int. New line has no arguments. Um, get int is used to get an integer. Um, on this first slide, you can see the function definition for, for new line, which is called on the next slide by get int. Sorry, they're on two slides. It's just the way it is. Um, and let's take a look at what new line does. It defines a char called symbol, and then it goes into a do while loop, and cn.get symbol while symbol does not equal the new line. So this will clear everything, including the new line character. Now you'll notice on the next slide it's called after the work has been done by get int. Hold on just one second. Let's let's move on to the next slide and take a look. Here we have the function definition for get int. It declares a char called ans, the answer, and then it jumps into a do while loop. It prompts the user to enter the input number, and then using cin, it initializes a number. Then using cout, it tells the user, it echoes the input, you entered space, and then it, it outputs the number, and asks the user, is that correct, yes or no? And then cin ants. Well, remember ants is one character. So if they type in YES or capital YES, that's fine. But we're only going to take one char in. The Y, whether it's a capital or a lowercase. And then we're going to clear out the rest of the new line, the uh, rest of the line of input. It's maybe the E, the S, and the new line. While ANTS not equal Y and ANTS not equal Y lowercase, we'll continue to do this. So if the user cap types in anything that begins with a Y, it will accept the input and move forward. But it will also clear the new line character. Here the author introduces the concept of inheritance. OS stream is a class of all output streams and cout is a member of the type OS stream. Uh, OF stream is the class of output file streams and this is a child class of the OS stream. You'll see more about this if you get to chapter 10. That's beyond the scope of the course I'm teaching, but you will see this later in object orientation, especially if you're a computer science major. Uh, here's an example of a function that can be called with OS stream or OF stream objects. Take a look at this and um, you get an idea of what inheritance means, hopefully. Here's a, another new line function. The new line function that we saw in program 6.7 only works with CN. This version works with any input stream. And you'll see it uses the get member function instead of the extraction operator. Here we take a look at it. At some examples of the new version of new line we discussed in the previous slide. It can be called with CN as the argument. And if the original version of new line is kept in the program, the call with CN as an argument produces the same results as the original call to new line with no argument. But new line can also be called with an input file stream object as an argument. 
and it will clear the line. It's not necessary to have two versions of the new line function, one for CN and one for a file stream. You can designate a default value, and it's specified in the parameter list. The default value is selected if no argument is available for the parameter. Here's how the new line header um, is written with CN as the default argument. If new line is called without an argument, CN is used. Otherwise, it uses the argument it's called with. Well, what do you do when some formal parameters have default values and others do not? Well, this is how it works. All formal, all formal parameters with default values must be at the end of the parameter list. Therefore, if there's blanks, they're at the end and they're assumed default. Think about it. If they were at the beginning and there were formal parameters without default values at the end, it wouldn't work. It would not know what to pass. Here's a coded example of a very simple void function called default args. And it has two formal parameters. They are both integers. But the second is set to minus 3, negative 3. It just simply outputs via C out arg1, a space, and then arg2. Let's take a look at um, how this void function can be called with one or two parameters. If we call it with one parameter or one argument, 5, the output is 5 space minus 3. It uses the default as negative 3. If we call it with two arguments, 2 ints, 5 and 6, the output is 5 and 6. It uses 6 in place of the default. This is a very, very useful feature. Here we take a closer look at how getInt checks the input. Do you check for yes or no? GetInt continues to ask for a number until the user responds positively, Y, capital Y or lowercase y, using the do while loop. You probably think, well, why not use N, capital N, or lowercase n. That's because the way this is structured, the user must enter a correct response to continue. A loop tested with capital N or lowercase n, if they mistyped BO instead of NO, and the B is right next to the N, it would, it would cause a problem. The user must enter a correct response to end the loop. This is good practice. This slide reminds us of the differences between CN with the extraction operator and the member function get used with CN. Um, and the big problem is the new line that ends each input line. CN with the extraction operator reads up to the new line character and leaves the new line character in the input stream. If you use cn.get, next we'll read the new line character. The new line function from chapter um, for program 6.7 will have to be used to clear the new line. Here's a little example of cn.get that reads um, into a character string called line that holds up to 24 cars. And uh, you'll see a little screenshot I created where you're using cn.get to read in five cars into line and then three cars into line. And the results you get, um, you can take this code, put it into um, a project and play around with it so you get a feel for how this works. Here's an example that shows how CN with the extraction operator 
versus cn.get handle the new line character. If you read cn with the extraction, if you use cn with the extraction operator to read in an integer from the dialog below where you enter 21, then enter, and then a, cn with the extraction operator reads 21 into the int number. Then you use uh, a char called symbol and you use cn.get to read the next char of input into symbol. Notice what the results are. Symbol contains the new line character, not A as you might have anticipated. This is the, the big issue with cn.get. Not, it's not an issue, it's just how it works and you need to be aware of that. If we had used cn with the extraction operator to get symbol, it would have skipped the new line character and symbol would contain a. But with the get member function, it does not skip the new line character. Is it me or are we beating a dead horse here? <laughs> Here's another slide that shows you how to affix to remove the new line character. Just, and I think I described this at the end of my last slide, just use cn with the extraction operator to get symbol. And it will get the a, not the new line character, as we got with the get member function. Still beating that dead horse. <laughs> Here, we use cn with the extraction operator and cn.get, as in the, ex the, the original example, but we call the new line function from 6.7 to clear the new line character and we will get using cn.get symbol will contain the a on the next line. Finally on to a new topic. EOF. EOF is a member function that detects the end of a file. It's a member function of every input file stream EOF obviously stands for end of file, and it returns a Boolean value, true when the end of the file has been reached, and false when there is more data to be read. This is really useful in an if statement. If we've not reached the end of file, continue to read. We can put it in a loop. It's very, very useful. Here's, an, here's a coded example using EOF. We use the get member function to read the first char into the in stream. Then we enter in a loop while we are not at the end of file. See out next, in stream dot get next. And we'll read each character in and place them into the output stream for see out, using see out. Note that the condition being tested in the while loop becomes false when the program reads past the last character in the file. The end of file is indicated by a special character and in stream.eof is still true after the last character of data is read. It only becomes false when the special end of character file character is read. Here are some recommendations as to which of the two methods we've seen the test for the end of the file. The author's recommendation is that you use EOF when input is treated as text and using a member function get to read input and otherwise use the extraction operator method when processing numeric data. Next, we're going to take a look at program 6.8 from your text. It reads every character of an input file called cad.det and copies it or sends it to the output file C plus add.dat. Except it takes every capital C and replaces that with the string C plus plus. It preserves line breaks. Uh, get is used for input as the extraction operator would skip line breaks. Get is used to preserve spaces as well. And we use EOF to test for the end of file. Let's take a look at 
6.8 in the next two slides. On this slide we see the beginning of program 6.8. Please look closely at the function declaration for the function called add++. Plus plus. It takes um, an input file stream object called by reference, formal parameter name in stream, and it also accepts an output file stream object called by reference, has to be, and its formal parameter name is outstream. And then at the bottom of this slide, you can see the call to add plus plus from main, and it uses fin and fout. fin have been declared as input file stream objects, and fout as an output file stream object. Uh, fin is opening cad.dat, and fout opens a file called C plus add dot dat. And you have the standard um, if statement with checks, which checks if either of the file openings fail. Let's take a look now at the details of add plus plus in the function definition on the next slide. So here we see the function definition for the void function add plus plus. It declares a char called next, and it uses the get member function to get the first char from the in stream, and then it goes into a while loop. And if it's not an empty file, it loops at least once. And while we're not at end of file, if next equals capital C, the char capital C, outstream, send through the outstream using the extraction operator, the string C++. Else, outstream next. Else, just echo. This is a simple find and replace that you see in many, many word processors. Only it's, it's doing the find and replace at the character level. It will continue to parse through the input file, echoing the output, and only changing the output when it finds a capital C. And it will continue to do that until it reaches the end of file. Here you see a simple dialog of uh, what CAD dot dat looked like when the program was run. Well, it doesn't change CAD dot dat. And what C plus add dot dat looks like. Wherever there was a capital C, there's now C++. There are some special predefined functions that work with um, characters. Uh, the CC type library is required to use these. Two upper is the one that's most common. There's the include directive if you want to use two upper. We'll, I think we'll take a look at that in the next slide. And it uses namespace standard. Should be no surprise to you. Two upper takes a char as its one argument and it returns the uppercase character of that argument. If you send it an uppercase, it's going to return the same char. Two upper and its brother or sister, two lower, um, actually return an integer representing the character, because characters are stored as integers assigned to a specific character. So here are some examples of um, C out with the function two upper. Another function used with char data is 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 space <laughs> is the function named is space <laughs> is space returns true if the argument passed to it is white space and white space is defined as spaces tabs and new lines so if we pass the literal just a space to is space it returns true Here's an example of is space used in an if statement. If is space next, see out a dash, else see out next. 
it prints a dash if next contains a space tab or new line character. Let's take a look, one last look at function, or I'm sorry, program 6.9 from your textbook for some more character functions. I was wrong. We're not looking at a program 6.9. I'm sorry. Uh, it's actually just a graphic from your textbook. 6.9. Um, there's two pages to this, and it shows some predefined character functions in CC type library. We've already talked about two upper and two lower that take one character as their argument, and they return the uppercase version of the char or the lowercase version depending if you use two upper or two lower. Here we have some more predefined character functions in the CC type library. Is upper returns true if the char is an uppercase letter, otherwise it returns false. Is lower is the opposite returns true if the char is a lowercase letter, otherwise it returns false. Is alpha, alpha is alpha returns true provided the char is a letter of the alphabet otherwise it returns false is digit returns true provided the char is one of the digits 0 through 9 other otherwise it returns false and is space we already took a look at and I think my friends we are coming to the end of chapter 6 this was a long chapter I'm sorry I hope you stayed with me because although it's the content of chapter 6 is rather easy as compared to chapter 5 and 4. It is, it is important. Here are some things to consider as a conclusion to section 6.3. Can you write code that will read a line of text and echo the line with all the uppercase letters deleted? This is an exercise we typically do in class. Can you describe two methods to detect the end of an input file? Yes, you can. And what is white space? That ends chapter 6, and thank you very much for staying with me. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and uh, take care. Have a great day.